Okay, welcome back um, to this first lecture in the course. Um, I actually think everything is working uh, uh, on the stream. If you have any questions, I will not be able to answer them on YouTube. You need to, or the YouTube comment field, you need to go into the Slack channel for the course and ask your questions there. Of course, anyone in the audience is also allowed to ask questions in Slack if you like, or just raise your hand as usual. Um, so, today's topic uh, is HTML. Uh, I would like to see some hands in the air. How many of you have done something in, in HTML and CSS? So that is like 70%, I would say, something like that. Okay, good. Um, I used to teach HTML and CSS, but that was a couple of years ago. Uh, since then, I've left like those parts of the web development community. I'm more active in the JavaScript and web application development community now. Um, However, HTML is like this technique that, I mean, it's always there. You all, you will, all, if you're writing web applications, you will always need to know how to write proper HTML because that is one of the foundations of the web. So in this course, we will have a brief in introduction to HTML. Uh, we will have a brief intro introduction to t CSS, which is like the presentation layer. Uh, and then we will focus on building web applications. But the first part of the course is HTML and CSS, and we will start out today with that. Let's see, where is the screen? There. Uh, I, I would like, to, if, because this is the first lecture I have for you, I, I would like to just point out that all materials in the course is published on, under the Creative Commons license. Uh, so if anyone likes, they are free to use this lecture or materials or exercises or whatever as they like. As soon, just, they just need to like reference us. Uh, and that could be good for all of you to know that all the materials, all the content is publicly ac accessible. So you could watch this on YouTube, you can find the material on the course page. You could, if you see errors in my slides, if you are, you know your way around GitHub, you could always like do a pull request on, on my slides, and I, I urge you to do so. And, uh, and, and your name will be forever <laughs> in, in, engraved in the lecture. Uh, so please do if you find some errors. However, many of you, how many has, has worked with Git and GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever before? Okay, so some of you, like 30%. Most of you are new to Git and GitHub. <coughs> uh, Git and GitHub are, are like version source control for, for code. Uh, subversion is like something that was used commonly before, not so much anymore. Uh, Git is, is, is the main player right now. Uh, we will use Git in the course. Uh, there are guides on the, on the, on the course webpage how to get started with Git. So follow those guides and get acquainted with, with Git and GitHub. I mean, those tools will be, if you're thinking of a career as a programmer, you will need to be familiar with those tools because they are used like everywhere. So uh, even if the company you will work at or your own company or startup <coughs> will use some other version control, it's kind of the same thing. So you, you need to, to, to be able to, to work structured with code in that way. So please, in the beginning of the course, if you feel like you have like spare time because the course is maybe a little calm, calmer, in, more calm in, calm, calm in the end, in, in the beginning. So, so use that free time or spare time to, 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 to get you acquainted with, with Git. And please do pull requests if you, if you can. So today we will talk, at, talk about the web as a platform because many of you have a background in Java may maybe and, and programming Java applications and desktop applications. So I will talk briefly about the web as a platform uh, and 
which protocols are the ones that are important. We will, of course, look at HTML, uh, how to structure documents using HTML, and some things to, to look out for. Uh, I, I, I will not stand here today and go over every element or property in, in, in the specification. That would be one boring <laughs> lecture. Uh, so, uh, I mean, after the lecture you will get uh, references to uh, places where you can like look that up uh, as you go. Uh, we will though have an overview of what we call tags, uh, but that's just an overview. Okay, so th th this is kind of like a picture that I, I always show because it's when, when you work on the web, this like simple model is, is, is just a must, must know, the client server model. Um, probably most of you are familiar with this like kind of architecture, simple architecture. Uh, but on the web, this is essential. Uh, on my uh, right side, we have the uh, server, and on the left side in this example, we have uh, the browser or the client. Uh, and the client is often, in, when we talk about web and HTML, the client often is, is a browser. However, that is, is changing. Uh, I mean, the browser is equal to like Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari. However, modern web applications are often executed in, in different uh, environments like as, as regular applications on your computer. If you install Slack, for instance, Slack in itself is a web application, but it's executing as a Windows or OS X, uh, Mac OS prog program or Linux program. Uh, but the client in itself corresponds to this model. So we have the client on one side. The client requests web pages from the server, and the server responds back to the client. And that is like the foundation of the web. In the early days, I mean, this was the model. And we only have simple requests and simple responses. All of this has changed the last years. So we have, um, have a lot of more protocols, more advanced protocols. We can do streaming and, and things like that. But we will in this lecture, just focus on this simple request and response model. So the client, when you write an URL, the client requests a document from the server, and the document is an HTML document. And the server responds with a document. And there are links in the document that forces the client to do other requests, like getting an image, or getting a style sheet, or getting some JavaScript, or whatever. And those requests could even be sent to other servers, not just our server. Uh, we will, in this course, focus entirely on the client. It's an introduction to web programming. In Calma, this course, <coughs> uh, this course corresponds to a course in Calma called client-based web programming. So we will do programming on the client. However, for you taking <coughs> the next course, the 1DV2 Three to three, five to three. Uh, you will focus your resources on the server instead. So that's the server-based web programming course, of course. Together, if you put those two together, you can do pretty much whatever kind of web applications you like. Uh, the server, I mean, the server is, is 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 needed to do things like authentication, save user data things like that. Today we can do a lot of things on the client, but in, in reality you, you will most often need a server as well. Um, I said that the client could be applications on the desktop. Of course, the client could be mobile applications as well, uh, packaged for the App Store or Google Play, for instance, if you like. That's getting a good traction now, and, and many of the apps you are using on your phones today are actually written with uh, web, uh, web techniques in, in, in the foundation or in the bottom. Uh, okay, <coughs> just a mis 
conception and I want you to have the like terminology right the web isn't the internet uh, you need to separate those two words the web is certain protocols <coughs> built upon internet and internet is the infrastructure uh, you might know this but many get it mixed up um, it's getting harder and harder to define what a web application is if we go back in time it was pretty simple okay so it's HTML pages served using the protocol HTTP so that's web pages or web applications however new protocols emerge uh, we don't necessarily use HTTP for all our web applications anymore we have other protocols in play web sockets for instance uh, but we will use the internet uh, as as like the foundation uh, and build web applications upon the internet so these are the protocols that we will get in touch with how many of you are taking the network security program yeah you are pretty familiar with the top two I guess you probably know the TCP IP, TCP IP model or OSI model by heart um, I did once <laughs> I don't need to anymore because I could more or less forget about those two protocols the internet layer and the tr transport layer protocols that handles traffic on on the internet I can focus on application layer protocols that is HTTP and HTTP is the foundation of the web that is the protocol that is used to serve web pages uh, the version 1.1 is the or one is the old one um, uh, we have a newer version of the HTTP protocol called 2 that are gaining gr ground um, if you look at Facebook and Google uh, and, and those kind of players they are converted have converted to HTTP 2 today however HTTP 1 is <coughs> probably the, the one that is most used still uh, we in this course we don't we do not need to focus that much on which HTTP protocol that we are using if we are using one or two however in the next course we will have a bigger discussion again uh, uh, regarding HTTP 2 and the differences between those protocols however when, when writing uh, client-side applications sometimes you need to make choices uh, there are good practices and bad practices and something that is good practice in HTTP 1 could be a bad practice in HTTP 2 uh, and I will like more or less throughout this uh, series of lectures I will always point out that okay so it's a good practice to do this however if you are using HTTP 2 you might be thinking about doing it this way instead so I just want to, 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 to make you aware that there, are, there is a difference between HTTP 1 and 2. Uh, we have uh, on the application layer, we have uh, this secure layer as well. Uh, you know it with the extension of S to HTTP when you write a web address or uh, URL uh, to get an encrypted layer upon uh, HTTP this is of course something that is important it is important today to have encrypted pages or encrypted communication um, Google for instance will punish you in a bad way uh, if you uh, don't use HTTPS you will get a lower you get lower in the search result page basically if, if you're not using HTTPS or as they will say they will get you a bonus if you are using HTTPS that's another way of saying it um, so but I mean when I started out ex when, when we built CoursePress for instance the, the, the web pages that we use for the course uh, that was in 2012 five years ago back then it wasn't like 
I mean, HTTPS, you used HTTPS when you used some kind of username and password, logins, for instance, when you, you log in users. So we use HTTPS when you're logged in, and we use HTTP when you're not logged in. And that is because of performance, because back then, making a secure connection was costly and resources for the server. Therefore, you try to like only use a secure uh, layer when you need really needed it uh, that has changed today you don't think about that you just try to default to using HTTPS everywhere so uh, however this is something that you need to consider on the server side so we will not talk a lot about that in this course however I will probably mention that in this case we are building a chat application we should probably use a secure layer because we have communication that could be sensitive, for instance. But in the server course, you will set up uh, uh, HTTPS as well. Uh, we also have a new protocol on new new. It's not that new anymore. WebSockets, uh, that is an application layer protocol. Um, so you could like when you load a web page you use http to load the page to the user but then you can switch to websocket for like re real time data like if you're creating a game for instance you probably want to sync all the players in the, this multiplayer game then you would need a websocket to to be able to do that there are other techniques so, as well but a websocket is one that is common or if you want to do like real time uh, stock market uh, prices or football results or whatever uh, you could use websockets and we will do that uh, in the course as well so we will use websockets for for some of the, the the applications this is pretty much it on protocols so HTTP and websocket those protocols are the ones that you should know and will use in the course and Today we're talking about H uh, HTML, and then HTML pages are served using the HTTP protocol. So, brief history, and I will. This will be a really brief history of the web. Uh, if you take the courses in Kalmar and the program, we have this in an extended version, but this will just be a brief overview. So, how many recognize this structure? Have it, can you relate to what this is? Yeah, it's a web page. Do you know what these blue things are? Yeah, links or anchors or whatever. You, you, you know, this is the first web page that was published back in 93. Do you remember or anyone know who, who published this page? The name of the person? It's a sir since like five years, I think. Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So Tim Berners-Lee is the like inventor of the web. Um, there were many others involved in like getting to this point, but in '93 he released this page uh, uh, and kind of uh, yeah, told the world that he invented something that he called the World Wide <laughs> Web. I mean, this is. Uh, quite simple. I mean, his, 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 he, he wanted to do this because he wanted to link like research documents together instead of needing to go to like a mainframe computer and, and run a program to get your research document. Why not la just distribute the documents on uh, researchers' computers all over the world and link them together using links? So that was kind of the vision for the web. However, uh, what happened? Uh, well, let's see. So when many of us got into the field of web development, that was in the early 90s. I wasn't that early because I, I, ha I, I used something called bulletin boards, BBSs. That was like the, the hot thing back in, in, in the early 90s where you could like exchange images or ASCII images and uh, uh, chat to, to other persons, you call them on a modem 
and then you could like communicate on a bulletin board and then when you have written your message you had to hang up so someone else could call in and write something and yeah um, so it was quite I mean it looked a little bit similar to the web but it was not nothing alike uh, however so I was on the bulletin board side I laughed at this and the guys and girls in this side, they say, oh, this will be the future. And I was like, no, 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 we have the future here. It's the bulletin boards. I was wrong, of course. So I started working with web, pa web pages back in 97, I think, or 8, maybe. Uh, but if you, if you did web pages in 94, it would look pretty much like this. You could add images, you could write something, and you could do this kind of list things you liked. Sorry, it's in Swedish, but it's just gibberish anyway. Um, and you could do links to other pages. Uh, typical web page in 94. However, um, Microsoft got into the business. They recognized that, oh, this web thing, that could be something interesting. We had a, uh, um, a browser called Mosaic back then uh, that were pretty commonly used. It later, uh, later Alta Vis, uh, uh, Netscape Navigator came into the picture and Microsoft made a, a competitor called Internet Explorer. Um, so back then everybody like competed to get the best developers to, to develop web page. I mean there wa wasn't that many web pages. So you, you wanted web pages that looked good in your browsers so that users would use Microsoft browser or Netscape's browser. So what happened was that Microsoft thought, oh, maybe we could like add some cool stuff to our browser so that developers will use our browser. So they added like fancy backgrounds. And then Netscape, they said, oh, we want that as well. And we will add this thing, cool thing. Uh, that made it so web pages looked like this in 96. Uh, you recognize them? Even if some of you are young, you've probably seen like there are still pages like this, of course, on the web. So fire was the fire. You needed fire on, on, on your pages. That was the coolest thing to have like fire everywhere. And chandeliers of some reason. I don't know why, but more or less every page has chandeliers. Running animals and spinning email signs. That was like things that got implemented or got support for those kind of things in the browsers and that made the pages look like this. Um, all often hard to, to read as well because you had some kind of wallpaper background that was terrible. Uh, but this was when like amateurs and everybody like played around and it looked like this. But what started to happen was that companies got interested in the web. They saw a possibility to like uh, uh, show themselves on web pages, show their company on web pages, uh, reach customers. So companies came into the picture. They tried to like structure things a little bit better. So web pages started to look a little bit more like this, where like you needed you needed some kind of menu to show choose different parts of the company. Um, you needed a little bit more structure, and you needed a efficient way of developing and. Uh, um, um, yeah, developing the pages. Something called frames uh, arised. Uh, frames was a pretty clever way to like divide a web page into several parts. So we had a top frame, and side frame, and a main frame. So if we had like ten pages, we didn't need to change the menu over and over again for every frame or every page. We could just change that one frame and the result would reflect on all the pages. Uh, the only frame we needed to, sh to update was the middle one because the, the, the header and the menu look, should look the same. However, the developers, this, they had this like big monitors. What was it like 640 times 480 in, in resolution? Um, and everything looked just great on their computers, on their monitors, and then a user with a lower resolution opened the page and the menus like got under the main content and often you needed to like scroll this page or the menu to see all the options, it was terrible. Um, 
disabled people had a real problem with this kind of web pages because if you're blind, for instance, you often use a screen reader that reads the information on the page for you, and the screen readers couldn't handle this kind of environment. Uh, in 99, search engines started to get really popular so that you could search for keywords on a page. If you had and used frames, it wasn't that or often you, you actually, if you, if you found a gubergren, that search word, and you came to this page using the, the, the search engine, you would just see this mainframe. You wouldn't see like the, the, uh, the top of the page and you wouldn't see the menu. So you couldn't navigate anywhere. You just got this page or you got <coughs> the header of the page, which was totally meaningless. Frames had a lot, a lot of problems. It was popular back in 99 to like nine, 2005 or something like that. Uh, today it's like never use. Uh, it's removed from standards. Uh, it's something that we will not even look at. This is the only thing I will say about frames. Uh, I know some of you have probably worked with frames, find them convenient. However, there are much better ways to do things like this today. So frames is nothing to, that should be used. Okay, so, so we, we went forward like five years. And what happened was web pages started to look like this again. So back in 2003, four, when everything started to normalize, this like play period was over and the web became really serious, web pages started looking like this again. And this is actually what we will produce in this course as well. Because this was what Tim Berners-Lee had in mind when he invented the web. HTML and web pages should only be information and structured information. How many of you have written a document in a word processor? I mean like Word or Google Docs or whatever it's called for OS 10. So it's like five out of 70 students have ever written a document in a word processor. Is that right? Okay, yeah, I'm not to judge. Um, I mean, uh, I guess sooner or later you will use a word processor and write like a thesis or something. Uh, or you, you might write everything in, are, are the rest of you writing in like Markdown? That would be, I would be impressed. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, I mean, if you are writing in Microsoft Word, for instance, you will do a header and you will mark it as a header and then you will write a paragraph and you will insert a picture and will this, I mean, I, I could have faked this in Word, right? It looks kind of like Word. And writing HTML pages and writing Word pages, it's completely the same thing. It's as simple as that. However, when I say pages look like this, it, it's not entirely true, right? Because this looks quite ugly. Uh, pages are, are much nicer than this. And what I mean when I say that pages today and HTML today looks like this is that the things making it look beautiful or at least trying to make it look beautiful is, is uh, style sheets and CSS. And that's after, the, the, uh, after lunch. So HTML is just producing this. Then we use CSS on top of this to make it look like whatever we like. So HTML is used for structuring information and linking information together, just like Tim Berners-Lee said in the beginning of the 90s. However, we have been on a long journey to get here again. But today in modern web development, you do a clear separation between the content of a page and the style of the pitch. And we will do that in this course as well. Uh, later on, we will see that we will also add JavaScript to the mix to alter the behavior of the pitch, to make things happen. But that's later. OK. Uh, I will use the terminology web pages and web applications. Have you heard me say home pages today? No, because I haven't. Uh, 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 home page is, for me, home page is like this word that 
Ah, I don't know how to say this without like breaking someone's heart. Uh, <laughs> but for me, if someone say, oh, I build home pages. OK, so you are a home page builder. Great. If someone comes and say, oh, yeah, I'll build web applications. OK, you're a developer. So developers and home page, home page creators. Uh, a home page in the beginning was, I mean, that was the home page of a company or the home page of a person or whatever. A web page is a more clear term. A web page is a page that is loaded over HTTP and uses web technologies to render. A web application, if we add to that, I would say, I, I often do this distinction, web pages are like lnu.se, that's a web page. You go there, you seek information, it has some parts that we could maybe call application, like the lot of, on web where you register yourself, but I would call lnu.se like a web page. However, if you start Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, whatever, I would call those web applications because it's so much more than just an information page, a web page. Uh, Spotify, for instance, is created using web technologies even if you run it on, on your computer. It's web technologies in the, in, in the background uh, executing. Uh, so that is a web application. Uh, the goal for like the first part is to create a simple web page. That's part one of the course. Part two and part three is to create web applications. And in the following course, we will add a server side to the, those applications as well. OK? I don't want to hear the word homepage. Yeah, right. Well, I, I, I will not punish you if you, if you do that. Uh, so how many of you have written programs in Java? That is like 80%. Some of you have probably written programs in C Sharp or PHP and yeah, many other languages and platforms. Uh, I mean, we could say that Java is a platform. I mean, you, you can do pretty much whatever you like in the Java platform today. You can write applications for desktop computers. You can write applications for uh, Android phones. Can you write? You could probably write iOS applications in Java and convert them to, to, to run on, on iOS if you like. Uh, so Java is, is like this big platform. And the web has become a platform as well. And in many ways, with the web has starting to, 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 to like become an operating system as well, or at least trying to compete with operating system. If you look at Google, Google Chromebook, for instance, it's, of course, a Linux operating system in the background, doing all the work with like hardware and stuff. But for the user and the user experience, it's more or less just a web browser experience and web applications running on the platform. And some, I guess, Android applications uh, also in the like, later versions. But, uh, so today, the web is such a capable platform that you could do most or more or less everything on, on, on that platform. You can play quite advanced games. You can do word processing. You can listen to music, watch videos. I mean, how many of you have an application, an installed application on your computer that you use to watch like videos on? Like, in, like, yeah, some of you have like Plex or something like that, maybe. Um, but I mean, YouTube is, I mean, if, if, I, if I ask anyone on the street for a video application, they will probably mention YouTube, and that's a web application. So, and I mean, we, we're converting as well. I mean, Word was de facto standard back in the 90s. Today, I wouldn't say that Word is de facto standard. I would say that Word or Google Drive or some, some other web-based uh, word processor is starting to gain ground, at least. We will treat the web as a platform in this course and try to explore like 
what you can do with the web as a platform. How many of you have worked with Internet of Things or come in touch with Internet of Things? Not too many, okay. Uh, Internet of Things is like, okay, connected things. It could be a camera that is connected to the internet so you could watch your living room live. It could be this doorbell that is connecting and uh, when someone is on the door. It could be sensors for heat, it could be light bulbs, it could be like everything. I mean, if, if you look at the industry right now, if something is hot and has been for the last year, it's Internet of Things. That is like just, if you go to a conference, you can be sure one of the topic will be Internet of Things because connected things is the big, new big thing. Uh, I mean, it's not a new thing. Internet of Things is not new. I worked with a company that developed Internet of Things things back in 96. And I mean, that is pretty long ago, but it's the, the, the last year it has been exploding. And a term that has come into play is something called the web of things. A problem with the Internet of Things is that many manufacturers have their own protocols. So I mentioned that on the web we had HTTP protocol and the WebSocket protocol, more or less. But when it comes to Internet of Things, you have so many protocols, Zigbee and whatever they're <laughs> called, Bluetooth and yeah, whatever, that just is used to connect things together. The problem with that is that things are not compatible. So uh, a sensor might not be, a sensor from one uh, distributor might not be compatible with the light bulbs that you have installed in that room. So that light bulbs cannot react to what's happening inside of the room or what, when the temperature change or whatever. Um, one solution to this is to use something called Web of Things. Because we have the web, it's standardized, we use the same protocols. Why not use the web as an umbrella to get all these, those things talking to each other? And that is the concept of Web of Things. Uh, we've been starting to, to, to play around a lot with this. Many of you have probably tried to do things. There are uh, a lot of like applications uh, in this area if you want to connect your your things at home. But this is also a thing for the web that because today Microsoft and Firefox and Apple and Disney and Samsung and I mean you could probably name a tech company of sites and that tech company is in a group called the World Wide Web Consortium that Tim Berners-Lee is head of. Uh, together all of those companies are developing the web as the platform. Of course, there are some bigger players, like Google is one major player, Microsoft, Apple, and Mozilla. Those might be the like four main players, but everybody that wants to can be in this community, pay a fee. I mean, Microsoft pays a lot of money every year to have developers like sitting and working with just the web for, for free, but on, on the expense of Microsoft. And, Google and all other doing the same thing. So the web is like this utopia, so to speak, that actually companies have come together now. It took a while. It took like until 2010 or something like that for all of those to get together and just go in the same direction, but they are right now. Um, and that makes the web beautiful, I think, because um, everybody are free to use it. It's not any royalties involved at least in most of the parts. There are some discussions still using video, but uh, other than that, uh, it's free and open and everybody can contrib contribute and use it as you like. Okay. So the goal of this course now is to create web applications and in the start web pages. And to do this, you need to start separating things. And I've shown you those simple web pages that we should like separate content from presentation. So let's have a look at, I, I could show an example actually, if you don't believe me. Well, where's my point? Oh, there it is. Uh, this one is a 
like classic web page that's been around since almost the 90s, I think. Uh, to just show what I mean by all web pages more or less looks the same. If we, I don't think I have any developer tools installed, so if we do something like, always hard to do this live. So I will just go in and alter some of the things in this page. Can I do it like this? No, I couldn't. Uh, can I remove it like this then? Ah, I can't see. Is there a delete? Hide element. Ah, delete. There was. So hard to see. Oh, there. Yeah. So what, what I did now was just to remove the style sheets from this page. And voila. Looks kind of like the page I showed, right? It's, it's some headers, some paragraphs, and a list of links. But as soon as we add the uh, CSS on this one, all, everything changes. So what I can do is just, this are, those are different CSS files. So the, the only thing that differs this page from the one we looked at before is that we have another design applied to this page. Okay? Could look like this. It could look like, okay, <laughs> what was the first one? Steel, okay, like that. It's the exactly, if I remove the style sheet, it would look exactly the same. The simple, simple um, HTML page. And now I said in the beginning that HTML is simple and CSS can be as hard as you like, and, and now you see why. I mean, HTML is, is nothing harder than just writing a simple Word document. But adding the CSS, this is the tricky part. However, the important part and this is a good thing. The important part is the HTML part because that's where you set the structure and there you have the information. <coughs> this is just like I can <coughs> and like to attract your viewers or, or your users. Uh, okay. Come on. Oh, neat. Uh, so the HTML is the structure is the same as the Word document, CSS or presentation or style sheets, that is adding styles to our pages. And on the later stages, we will also add behavior to the pages. And there is a reason why I have separated this. And that is because I want you to separate this as well. You could, if you like, you could just create one file and you can add all of your CSS right into that file and just throw in all of the JavaScript in the same file and you can get whatever result you, you want. You could like build Spotify that way. You will have a really hard time. The performance would probably be really bad, but you could. However, we should not do that. I, I think you are pretty used. If you have, I mean, you have a course in programming before, you have programming Java, you don't put everything in one big file. You try to separate classes, you try to like separate it so you get an organization so that many people can work with separate files and separate parts of your application. You should think exactly the same thing here. Separate, 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 separate HTML in files, separate presentation in different files, and separate behavior in different files. Separate them as much as you like as much as you like. The important part is that you as a developer have a good support, that the team can work in a good way. After that, we can start thinking about delivering this to the user. Maybe we shouldn't deliver like 200 CSS files to the user. Maybe one is the optimal HTTP one, or maybe 10 is optimal in HTTP2. Uh, so we can think about that in later stages. So, so in the beginning, just think separate in logical parts. I will talk a lot about that. Uh, yeah, before the break, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. So this is a simple word processor. What you do is writing headlines. It, it, 
if okay so how would you do this task if i ask you to like indent this paragraph how would you do that in a word processor how many would place the marker and press space 10 times and then go to the next next line and press space and is that the right way to do it probably not what you're doing if you're doing that in a word processor you are adding style into the content right so you want something to look in a certain way and you do that by adding styles adding more spaces or the classical one okay we need a headline so we take like a normal text we mark the headline and we increase the font size and we make it bold and now we have a headline is that the correct way to do it no how do you do it you mark it and you tell that this is a header three or whatever it's exactly the same thing when it comes to to uh, web pages why is it important because i mean if you do it like that that i said first that you just increase the size and make it bold i mean for a visitor that is that watches this page page visual visual many hard words now visually it will look great it will look like a, a header however when a search engine and the search engines are you can see them as blind persons if a search engine enters the page it will only see the normal text so it will not recognize that this is a header and it's important to tell search engines what is what because the search engine will if it's a header the search engine will see like okay this is important this is probably what this page is about and that is information that you want to provide to the search engine so that the search engine could provide provide better results to the end user uh, very important and that's why i mean when you when you are developing oh when you are developing um, pages don't only look at this picture sometimes you need to step back just remove the style styling of the page and look at the bare html and make sure that it's okay when you start to get used to writing html that will be in your bones so you will not have to do that but at the beginning it could be good to just get rid of the the, the style sheets now and then okay i get no questions on 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 the distance uh, i will just repeat if you have questions please ask them in slack i monitor that one so with that after the break we will start looking this was more of an introduction after the break we will start looking at how to write uh, html pages okay welcome back uh, so in the break i, I got a question uh, about the i mean every wednesday i will be here at 9 30 hopefully if the bus isn't late uh, and some of you have a lecture ending at 10 so i mean those 30 minutes between 9 30 and and or 45 minutes actually but between 9 30 and uh, a quarter past 10 this is just i am here if you have any questions you know i will try to be here at least so so you can always show up so it's kind of a, a, a tutoring pass uh, however i will also because you're quite quite a few students taking this course i will try to uh, add another tutoring pass that will be held remotely from kalmar over skype uh, but i will try to add that so it will not interfere with this uh, uml course that some of you are taking the one dv 607 or something like that um, uh, so watch out in the schedule there will be another tutoring pass as well uh, tutoring uh, uh, lecture as well any other questions during the break yeah and uh, today from one to three is just a normal day uh, and today uh, between one and three is just a normal day i'm just repeating for for the mic uh yeah uh, it is it's it's uh, a lecture with css yeah but it will be the same as last year more or less it's never the same but i mean the content is the same okay i forgot one thing before the break uh, just just a brief overview over the standards that have emerged since the early 90s uh, 
you don't need to know them by heart, of course. I, I will not question you on, on, on dates and on uh, when was uh, the release date of CSS2. I, I, I just want to show you because it says something about how the web was developed. So back in the 90s, uh, the web was born. In 93, the first web page was uh, uh, released and uh, uh, HTML1 saw, saw the, 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 the daylight. However, the first real specification was the HTML2 in 95. Um, CSS came a year later, so I mean, there was a year when you couldn't do any styling to web pages, and that's why a lot of those things happened that Microsoft started adding like tags for blinking text and uh, stuff like that. Um, okay, so the development went on. However, in the late 90s, something happened. And I mean, you are developers, you have developed in, say, Java. It would be really difficult to develop Java programs if you didn't have a compiler that told you when you wrote something wrong, right? It would be a hazard if, if that compiler instead guessed when something was, I mean, okay, you wrote one in the if statement. No, that is not a good, uh, I, but say, say you wrote off, O-F-R instead of four and the compiler kind of guess that you mean the if, so it just inserted if instead, and didn't give you a warning or didn't give you an error. You wouldn't like to like program in a language that did that. However, HTML will do that. So even from the start, the web browsers kind of guesses what the developer writes and try to render that to the user. And in part, that's a good thing. That, that has probably been one of the reasons why the web has been successful, because everybody has been able to create web pages. Because you could just write something. If you, if, you, if, you, if you don't care about HTML, you just write, hello world, save the file, and watch it in the browser. The browser will present it as hello world. And that is because the browser will recognize, OK, you miss something, you miss a couple of things. This hello world should probably go in the content part of, of the page, adds it there, adds every meta tag and every like other part of the page for you. But as the web developed, developers, real developers got into the picture and wanted to like use this as a professional tool. And it's not a professional tool if, if, if you can't rely on how the web browser will present things. If, if the web browser start correcting you, you will be quite mad. So there kind of emerged a new standard called the uh, XHTML. How many of you have programmed in or programmed, have marked up stuff in uh, XML? Yeah, so some of you are familiar with XML, but XML is a standard for, for marking information or marking up data. Uh, Screensaver, I hope. What? Strange. Apple is often quite good at not turning on screensavers when you're in a presentation. Um, okay, so XML is this really structured way of structuring data. It's really good at structuring, structuring things. So the World Wide Web Consortium thought that, huh, so HTML looks kind of like XML, and that's because both stem from something called SGML, that is a, a meta language for other languages, and both HTML and uh, uh, XML stems from the same uh, parent. So they thought, okay, so let, let's make it an XML application instead of an SGML ap application. With that, we could like have this draconian error handling so that if a developer doesn't comply to the rules, we, the developer gets an error message. And that was called XHTML, extendable HTML. So when I taught HTML back, I started in 2002, 
when I had classes in HTML, I, I said, OK, HTML 4.0 was the last HTML standard. It's XHTML that will be the future of the web. That was like, I was certain of that. Because it's, it's good for developers. It's, it's, it's much easier when we get error messages. However, uh, what happened was that it wasn't such a good idea to, to just add this error layer upon HTML. What would happen if, for say, say that you develop a web page and you bring in an ad from another company, and this ad uses HTML, and there is an error in the HTML? OK, your page will crash. And it w the user will see an error message saying, OK, you forgot to close the tag at line 98. I mean, it would be a disaster for Facebook if an ad just broke Facebook, right? Uh, OK, that could have been ways around that. But what happened was that in, in the early 2000s, a group um, split from, from the World Wide Web Consortium. They said, we don't like this new heading of XHTML. We want a more open and free and experimental standard. Uh, they uh, called themselves the What Working Group, W H A T Working Group, What Working Group. And developers of Opera, the web browser Opera, the Norwegian web browser Opera, were in the like, front, and, and others uh, joined. So they started working on another specification and say, OK, let's not, uh, let's not let HTML4 be the last version. We start drafting in HTML5 or HTML next or whatever they called it. So they started in parallel to develop this new version of HTML and the World Wide Web Consortium stuck to XHTML. However, in later years, some were, yeah, in this region, 10 years ago, uh, the groups got together and they committed that, okay, this HTML5 will probably be the future, XHTML will be canceled, and HTML5 is the new thing we will look at. Uh, a big thing here was, for instance, video, uh, the, the, the support natively for video in web pages. Uh, before we had to rely on Flash or other plugins to show video, but in HTML5 we don't anymore. Uh, there are many other things in HTML5 that is new. They have new semantics. I will talk more about that today. We have uh, more, instead of being just this big standard document with everything, HTML5 is divided into parts. So it's more like more, f more uh, separated view of HTML. So say that, OK, we need something to handle video. OK, we call that the video module, more or less, and, and, and make it as a separate standard, almost. So HTML5 is this like more dynamic standard than, than the rest of them. Uh, it was released in 2014, and we are now at version 5.2, if you follow the V3C line, or the World Wide Web Consortium. If you ask the What Working Group, that one is still active. They are working with exact, they are doing the things together, but they are working in parallel. So there are two standards, the What Working Group standard and the World Wide Web Consortium standard. They say exactly the same thing. They are synced. But I think that the, the World Wide Web Consortium has version numbers, and the What Working Group doesn't, because they don't think that it should be versions. It should just be a living standard. So they have like different philosophies. You can find them, uh, the living standard you can find here on the What Working Groups page, and you can find uh, V3CS version on this page. Um, whatever you like, you can, w what you can look in, in, in whatever you like of those two. Uh, there you'll find a standard. If you have any questions, you can always go to the standard and look up your question there. However, one thing that differs a lot is back here, the web browsers corrected developers. So if you wrote something wrong, the browser tried to correct it. However, this was not regulated in a standard. So every browser could correct the user in different ways. 
that was a real problem for developers. So in the newer versions, in HTML5, there are separate specifications. There are one for developers, this one, but there is also a specification for um, uh, client developers. So if you are creating a browser, for instance, if you want to create a new browser, there is a different standard that you can apply to that says how you should handle errors as well. So, okay, if the user does this or the developer does this, you should correct it like this. So it makes it so that for a developer, it's not as hard as it was back in the 90s. It's much easier to develop web pages today. Uh, you will, this is a page I can recommend. You will probably use it a lot. I do. Where's, where's the pointer? Can I use .com? And I mean, back here, if you were to develop web pages in the, in the early 2000s or in the 90s, web browser compatibility was a real issue. How to make a web page look the same in every browser. Um, it's, it's not that difficult anymore to make the web page look the same because that standard is set. All modern browsers implement it in the same way. However, the new thing right now is to use APIs in the browser. So we have the mobile phones, for instance. OK, can I access the battery status? Can I access the camera, the gyroscope? How about creating VR or AR experiences for the phone? That requires the phone to, to show APIs to the browser so that we as web developers can use this, those APIs. If you're developing applications for Android in Java, you have direct access to those APIs because that is like <coughs> those APIs get, release, re, get released with the hardware more or less. However, on the web, that must be standardized in some way so that it will work the same on Android, iPhone, whatever. So they are a little bit behind in time, but the, the APIs are getting to, to web developers as well. But that poses a problem. OK, can I use this API? Which browsers will support it, for instance? And this page is perfect for this. So WebSockets, for instance, this protocol. Um, if I search for WebSocket, we get up a view of which browsers support WebSockets. Today it's all except Opera Mini, but Opera Mini it's such a special case. It's used mainly where you have really poor connection to the internet and it's on feature phones, it's not smartphones. So you could regard that one, it's, it's, a, it's a special case. But you can see here that, okay, WebSockets are supported in all major browsers on all major platforms. And you can go back in time if you, uh, I think, show all, yeah. Uh, you can see how the support has, has grown. So, okay, we are going to need to support Internet Explorer 9. Oh, that's a problem. We can't use WebSockets. So you can use this page for checking API, um, checking which APIs you can use or which CSS techniques, for instance, you can use. And I will get back to that. The big problem today, if we look at this one, oh, where is Date related, is it that one? No. So, um, if you were a developer for 10 years ago, the big problem was Internet Explorer, or five years ago even. It's not today because you can more or less, if you're not a special case, you can more or less don't care about Internet Explorer, soon at least. <laughs> Which one of those browsers do you think will cause you the most headache today? If you ha had to guess, Safari. Safari, which one? This one or uh, for uh, uh, mobile? mobile? Mobile. Any other guesses? Edge. Edge. <coughs> yeah, maybe Edge. But Edge, I mean, Microsoft has done a really good job in supporting new standards. They are on, on, on their toes right now, and they are doing a lot of good work. So often it's not Edge. It is iOS, for Safari for iOS. And in Sweden today, 
Which browser do you think is the biggest one on the mobile market? iOS, Safari. So we're kind of back 10 years ago when everybody was using Internet Explorer, but now they are using iOS for Safari. And I, Apple is kind of acting as Microsoft did 10 years ago. They are slow, they are like, oh, well, we will see. Maybe we'll release it in a year or two. I don't know. So if you will get a problem, it will be with iOS on Safari. But we'll get back to that, unfortunately. OK. So time to get started with the code. When you write HTML, I said you can just write hello world in a document, in a text document, and open it in a browser, and it will say hello world. However, that is not the correct way of doing it. You should, as developers, should tell the browser that I am a developer, I know what I'm doing, so I will write the code for you. This is a minimal HTML document. It's not really. You could skip a lot of things here and still comply to standard, but I would argue that this is what you should at least write. Uh, and we will, I will break it down for you. So starting at the top, we have the doc type. The doc type kind of tells the browser that you are a developer. That was kind of the meaning with the doc type in the beginning. Because back when we had amateur developers that just <coughs> tried to get things working, and real developers, the browser needed a way to separate the good from the bad. And they did that by utilizing something called doc type switching or a doc type. So for instance, Microsoft, I, I, I will bash Microsoft a lot on this lecture, but I, I redeemed myself and said that they are actually doing good work right now. But if we, I should borrow this window, which is kind of ironic when it comes to Microsoft. Um, is it in picture? No, but if I do it like that, almost, whoa, I need to move it all the way here. Okay. So you are developing web pages and you are supposed to do a box on the web page. And you specify the width of the box. <clears throat> if this is the box, who, and you need to raise your hands, would argue that the width of the box is this one? OK? Who would argue that the width of the box is this one? Yeah, most of you. <coughs> And you who didn't raise your hand, what's your definition? Is it like in the middle? <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the logical way of looking at it. OK, this is the width of the box. However, the HTML standard said that this is the width of the box. What do you think the Microsoft engineers did? They said, that's kind of quirky. Ah, we say that the width of the box is this one in Internet Explorer. Okay, so if you develop the web page and set the width to 100, in some browsers, 100 would be this one, and in some, it would be this one. So, so, so the width of the box would differ depending on which browser you watched it in. And I mean, okay, I, I can agree with the engineers that this is the more the logical way, but this was the standard. So to get rid of this problem, when a real developer used the pages, the real developer wanted to use the standard, this width. And if you added a doc type to your page, the browser would know that, OK, this is a real developer. We will render the page according to standard. And Microsoft implemented that as well. So, so that Internet Explorer had these two modes it switched between. So, so if it was a legacy page where you wanted the width to be this, you didn't add a doc type and it would be rendered like that. 
and in uh, other modes it was rendered like this. And the doc type did that for you. Um, so that's why it's important to always, always add a doc type to your pages, especially in older browsers, because it will trigger something called quirks mode if you don't. And if you're in quirks mode, a lot of quirky things will happen. And, and you will look at the standard, and you will implement it, and it will not be the same as in the standard. So by adding this one, you will trigger quirks mode in the browser. Uh, you will tr trigger standard mode in the browser, and you will be coding according to standard. In newer browsers, this is not a problem. But in certain versions of Firefox and Internet Explorer, this is a must. Add it first in your document, like this. Less than bang doc type space HTML. OK? That's just something you need to learn. Or be really good at copying and pasting. Um, but I mean, if, if you looked at the doc type back in the 2008, the doc type was like 300 characters mixed big and uh, uppercase, lowercase. If you wrote one letter wrong, you triggered quirks mode. So then I argued that you should copy doc type. In this case, you could probably learn it by heart. OK. The next, <coughs> no. Where is it? Oh, yeah, of course. So we need some just terminology before we continue. So when talking about HTML, we, there are certain concepts we need to be aware of, certain words. Most, many of you have heard the expression tag, a tag, an HTML tag. And a tag is this one. It looks the same as in XM, XM, XML. And that's because it comes from the SGML standard. So you have a, something called a start tag, this first one, and an end tag. That is how you mark up things. You place the thing you want to mark up between the start tag and the end tag. Uh, in this case, the EM is emphasize, that we want to emphasize something. In this case, the HTML word in this sentence. Uh, if you were to do this in a word processor, you would probably mark the word HTML and press the italic. That's kind of the same, but not really. Um, but this will emphasize the HTML word uh, like that. And I, I will get back to emphasizing. OK? This, the whole shebang with the content in the middle and the tag, it's called an element, an HTML element. So we have tags, put the tag together with the content, and we got an element. You are probably familiar with the word attribute, because you have attributes on objects, or properties, you might call them. Um, an attribute or a property is written inside of the start tag always, just as a name. In this, uh, Those are predefined, so class is a predefined <coughs> keyword equals more. So you add a property to the, the tag. In this case, we add the class property and assign it more. So properties, you do it like that. Uh, yeah, it says attribute value in the, in the end, but property value or attribute value, it's that one. OK? Clutch on course spot. Hop. Good. Uh, Let's start. So we have the doc type. Now we need to specify that this is an HTML document. So we have a root element. In XML, you call it the root element. We have a root element called HTML. It just says that, OK, this is an HTML document. I mean, we could have other types of document. But this is an HTML document. Uh, we tell with the property or attribute lang that this page content is written in English. So if the content of the page is Swedish, you'd write SV instead. This is the main language of the page. Of course, you can mix languages on a page, but you often have one main language. Is the main language English, or is it Swedish? 
If you have a quote later on in, in Swedish, you could just mark that quote as being Swedish. Why do we do that? Well, accessibility reasons. So if you have a screen reader that reads the page for a blind person, it's important for the screen reader to know which language the page is written in, because it will apply different uh, yeah, voices or, or, or read up for, for different languages. languages. It could have been important for search engines to know what language, so that, okay, we might prioritize Swedish pages on, in Sweden. However, this has been so misused so that Google will not touch it, I think. It will just look at the content and make its own judgment if this is Swedish or English. But, I mean, it could look at it if it, if, if it wanted. Uh, and that is the HTML tag that embodies everything else or encapsulates everything else. Inside of the HTML element, we have a head portion and a body portion. So HTML, head, and body. Simple as that. The head is things that are not visible on the page. It could be things like the title that is shown in the browser bar. It could be things like which character set is being used. Uh, which resources are being loaded, things that not, are not directly visible to the user. Inside of the body, we have the content of the page. I may, might even have... A, oh, sorry, I haven't switched. That... sorry. Uh, so, the head. The title, as I said, uh, the meta care set, the character set. Uh, the character set is like how the characters on the page are encoded when you write them in your editor. So if you open like Eclipse or some other editor and save a page, a text file, it will encode all characters using a care set. Uh, we often use UTF-8 as a Unicode character set right now. However, Different operating systems and different environments might implement other character sets. We have someone, something called ISO 8859-1, which equals Windows 1252. Yeah, uh, and this is just different ways of 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 uh, encoding the characters. I would recommend you all to use UTF-8 and make sure that your, the editor you will use also saves your documents using UTF-8. For Swedish students, it's a simple test. It's just to write in the body or uh, uh, Swedish characters. If they can come out as like gibberish or question marks or whatever, you have a mismatch between the character set you are using in the dev, uh, development tool and what you have specified here and then you need to change it, either here or in the development tool. Uh, however, A to Z, 0 to 9, those, those characters are often on the same place in several different character sets. So you will not see a difference there. It's when you use special characters that are special for, for a certain language that you will have trouble. And I get. How many of you have Swedish letters in your, or, uh, in your first or last name? Yeah, some of you. And you have probably many times added like your, those letters in form fields and then you get a ticket and it's just gibberish because somewhere on the line someone messed up with the character sets. So that is quite usual. Uh, okay, the body, this one you add the content. So whatever you write here between the body start and the body end, that will be shown on the web page. Simple as that. Okay, what to add in the body? So what we need to know about HTML is that everything will be divided into blocks. So if you add a headline, a header, just like you do in Word, you get the same kind of result. You will get a new line feed in the end, and this header will fill from the left to right, 
fill the whole page in a box. And this is called a box module, a model, when it comes to, to, to HTML. Um, this model has been redone when we, when we are in HTML5. It's a completely new model. However, this base model still works. And this is actually the, the only thing that is important when you develop in practice. If you want to go down deeper in the theory, you can have a look at, at the, new, uh, uh, the new model. But I, it, it's no use. You need to know what a block element and an inline element is. That's what you need to know. So a block element is this one, like headers, like paragraphs, like list elements. They all make out boxes. But if you use, for instance, an, the EM tag that we looked at, the emphasize tag, like this, that will it skew all the letters, make them italic, that is not a block element. It would be ridiculous, right? You have this paragraph, and then you want something that is emphasized, and it will be on a new line and a new box. That wouldn't make sense. So those are called inline elements, if you underline or if you make something strong or uh, things like that. Links, for instance, is an inline element. I mean, you can have a link inside of a block. So you need to, to, to know the difference between block and inline elements. And which ones are those? Which is which type? Uh, it's often quite natural because inline element you will get inline elements when you need inline elements and block elements when you need block elements. But s typical block elements are the headers, headers, header one to six, the paragraph tag that makes a paragraph, or the div tag. Div is just a um, a generic block element. It doesn't say anything about what the content is. It's just a, a container or a generic type. So divs are those like you can use them to block things in, in logical boxes, if you like. Inline elements are like image, A, EM, strong, Underline, uh, 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 you, you, uh, uh, oh, whatever. Uh, okay, but we want something like this. We want some kind of structure on our web page, and we do that by just moving boxes. And you move those boxes using CSS, and we are not using CSS yet, but we want something like this. If, if we do a simple mock-up on a paper of a web page, we will probably start out by, OK, we want the header, we want the menu, we want some content. We, we need articles, so we need like this and that. And we will end up with something like this. And it's a good start, because then we have our main blocks of our page. <coughs> this is how you did it back in HTML4. The problem with this was that, OK, we add a div. This is a div with, let's see if I have, yeah. So this is a div, just a container. And we set an ID just f so we know what this is. And we set the ID header, because this is the header. And then we make a div here, and we name it nav. So we know this is the navigation. In Sweden, you often see menu, or menu in English. And this is the content. And here we have news. And this is just something else. This was the way good developers structured the pages. The problem with this approach is semantics. Because if a computer looks at this page, like a search engine, and try to like structure this page and see what is important, it's really, really hard for the computer to know what is the navigation, what is the header of the page, what is the content of the page. because I mean, in this case, it says content. In Sweden, it could say, like, innehall, main, m, whatever. Um, so it's really hard to, to, like, make computers look at this page and see the semantics. And this is what was addressed in HTML5. So in HTML5, a lot of new elements was added to add semantics to web pages. 
So if we look at this structure in HTML5, and this is how you are supposed to do it now, you will see that we have a tag called header. We have a tag called nav. We have a tag called main, article, aside, section, and so on. So they added a lot of semantical or semantic tags to the language. Now when Google, when Google or any other search engine looks at this page, it will immediately know that, okay, this is the header of the page, this is the main content, and this is the navigation. And it's really easy to, to write a crawler that will like index this page, use the navigation to navigate to the next one when you're finished and so on. It will know that, okay, a side, a side is like side information. It's related information, but it's not important for the page. So we could just skip things that, that are written here. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think, oh well, I have. Okay, so if we, if we trans, I mean, now everything is, this is three columns and everything is nice. In practice, this will be the header and then the nav will be here and then the main will be here and then a side will be in the bottom because we haven't added any CSS yet. I think I have an example of that soon. So the structure, if we look in the code, in the body, and this is just the body. I have excluded the header and the HTML, but you should always include it when you write your code. In this case, we have added the header, the nav, the main, the aside, and inside the main, we have each article. And the article is a separate, like, the easiest thing is to think of a news page. And um, each article is its own separate story, more or less. Uh, you can look at articles as something that you could always republish somewhere else in its uh, entire, in the entire part of the, the article. You should just be able to lift it from your page and include it somewhere else and it should be enough. So an article is like a sub part of a page. It could be a news header, a news, news uh, article, of course. Uh, or it could be a blog article, or it could be something else. But it's it's a separate part of the page. We have grouped that inside of a main. And the aside, as I said, it could be banners for commercials, or it could be like yeah, something that that is not related to the content of this page. So this is a pretty neat structure. We have the navigation early. You could argue that it's better to have the navigation at the end. There are discussions regarding this and uh, um, uh, accessibility, accessibility for disabled. Um, so if a screen reader reads this page and the navigation is here, it's really good for a blind person to get the navigation early, be able to do his choice and get to the main part. However, when you get to the second page, the navigation will start read again. So some argue that it's better that the nav is at the end. However, a good screen reader should know that this is a navigation and not even read it for the user. It should just skip it. So I think this is a pretty good structure. Uh, when, you not, when you start to write your HTML, it's a good thing to use something called a validator. Um, if you're used to writing HTML, you will probably not need to. If you're new to HTML, it's a quite quite nice to be able to, to um, if we take this page, uh oh, come on, uh, if you go to this page and you paste your address to your web page, it will validate the page for you, check it for errors, and you will get kind of a, it's like, like a compiler. You will get warnings and you will get errors. I have a lot of warnings in this one. It's not mine. It's, it's the presentation tool. So I could blame someone else. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, do this because you will start off by writing the HTML. And if you do a lot of errors in that one and then try to add CSS, you will have a really hard time because you will like need to compensate for errors you did in the HTML. And then you correct the HTML and the CSS will be all messed up. So when you're 
kind of done with the, the mock-up of the HTML. Just run it through the validator and fix if you have any problems, and then you could start adding CSS. And of course, this is an iterative, is it called that? Iterative model where you like alter the HTML and you alter the CSS and the HTML and CSS, of course. But, but in the beginning, try to, to use the validator. Uh, I might have some slides left, one or two, maybe, let's see. Okay, so just, just, I mean, you will add a lot of elements. I talked about the div, P is the paragraph, you have the headers, you have the lists, you have the different semantical groups, and you have a lot of inline elements. I mean, this is pretty much those that are here. You should probably know them. It's forget about the B and the I. But the other ones you could kind of learn. Uh, you will learn them if you, if you write HTML for a while. You will learn all of those. There are many more, but those are the most important ones. Uh, I, I just added B and, B and I because it was out of the standard. Because what B does is it says that something should be bold, right? Just as you mark something in a word process and press the B, it should be bold. But bold isn't a semantical, doesn't add meaning. It just says that something should be pre presented in a bold font. So that is presentation. I, italic, it's presentation. Those were uh, uh, brought out of the standard and they added strong and em. Strong says that something should be, I mean, if a screen reader reads something that is strong, it will probably raise its voice because it's, oh, we should add a strong meaning to this word. Emphasize, I, I'm not even, I mean, there are a difference between emphasizing something and, and reading it with a strong voice, but emphasize is the same thing. It's, okay, this is important. We need to emphasize this. It's not just italic. So they removed those. If you were just to do something, add, make text italic, you should use CSS instead. But then they added them again. And that's because of legacy reasons, because <laughs> developers keep, kept on using those. So they are there because developers kept on using them. If you are to use them, you should be able to give us the explanation of the semantic meaning of those. They, they have a new semantic meaning. You need to go into the standard and look at the semantic meaning. It's, it's just a construction to, to, to make them fit in the standard. So uh, don't use them. <laughs> use EM and strong if you need, okay? Uh, when you start writing HTML, you do it in a word, uh, uh, in a text document, simple text document in your favorite editor. You can use Eclipse if you like. We will, in this course, recommend you to use Visual Studio Code. It's available for Mac, Linux, and Windows. Uh, we will use, uh, my examples will be, sh I will show my examples in, in Visual Studio Code. But you can use whatever editor you like. You save the text document, you uh, publish it on GitHub. Instructions are in, 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 uh, in the exercise. And then you write your HTTP address to visit your page. And you need to publish your pages to be able to, to, to look at them, it's especially when we start to adding JavaScript. Then often you need to have a web server to be able to, to work with certain APIs. But in this case, you will publish, publish the web page on the internet uh, using um, GitHub. Yeah. One thing about indenting code as well, you are pretty used to indent code, not writing everything in the left margin. Uh, you should do that as well in uh, uh, HTML. You can always debate if you should uh, use like two spaces or four spaces or add a tab. I think the code standard for the later assi assignments says two spaces and you will be forced to use two spaces. So, so if you press tab, it will uh, um, insert two spaces. Um, but later, that's when we start using JavaScript. 
And this is, of course, something that is really important if you are working in the team. <laughs> it's a hazard if half of the team are using uh, tabs and half is using spaces. Uh, and I mean, you can have religious discussions about which one to use. And pr I promise you that you could like spend days on, 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 on YouTube just like listening on arguments for and against. Uh, oh, skip that one, skip that. Yeah, well, HTML comments. You can do comments in the HTML code. You do it like this. It's, you cannot use the slash uh, star uh, comments that you're used to. You need to do it like this in HTML. What you need to be aware of, if, if you write a comment in HTML and publish it, users will be able to see the comments if they look at the source code, of course. However, if you use a development environment, uh, you will probably, in that development environment, set, up it, set it up to remove all comments. But yeah. Uh, and the last thing, uh, I have a lot of references uh, on this uh, lecture. If you go into Mozilla Developer Networks, Mozilla is really great in serving developers and giving good documentation. If you want a good documentation over HTML, like a book, more or less, visit Mozilla Developer Network. That's all you need. They have perfect documentation of everything regarding HTML and getting you started. Uh, you could use the standard, but it's quite dry reading. It's like, well, it's heavy. This is presented in a better way. HTML Rocks is a good site if you want to follow the community. V3 Schools, stay out of that. Uh, if you Google something, you will find V3 Schools. In, in, uh, in earlier years, they had a lot of errors on the site, which made developers do things falsely. Uh, they kind of looks like they are a part of V3C, but they are not. They are like a private company just trying to earn money on you getting certificates. Stay away from VT schools. Uh, they are really good in search engine optimization, so they always end up in the top. If you Google something, go to Mozilla Developer Network. They are the best. OK, so a break. And after the break, at like 1.15, we will start looking at CSS. And I want to stress as well that this lecture, there is another version on the web page. If you like, you could watch that version. In that, I talk about HTML entities, for instance. So, okay, thank you.